Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be with you again. We're going to have an awesome time of worship. Let's sing to the Lord a new song. That's what we are here for, and just worship with us. Here we go. Turn up the music and sing along. Let's praise the Lord with a joyful song. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let everything that has breath sing of His faithfulness and His wondrous love. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say and again rejoice in the Lord always and again I say and again sing praise to our God sing praise from the heart rejoice sing praise to our God sing praise from the heart rejoice Turn up the music and sing along Let's praise the Lord with a joyful song Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made Let everything that has breath sing of His faithfulness and His wondrous love Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made Oh, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord Always and again I say And again rejoice in the Lord Always and again I say And again sing praise to our God Sing praise from the heart Rejoice, sing praise to our God Sing praise from the heart Rejoice Sing to the Lord a new song For He has done marvelous things Sing to the Lord a new song Every morning new mercies He brings Sing to the Lord a new song for he has done marvelous things. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say and again. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say and again. Sing praise to our God. Sing praise from the heart. Rejoice. Sing praise to our God, sing praise from the heart, rejoice. Sing praise to our God, sing praise from the heart, rejoice. Sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things sing to the lord a new song every morning new mercies he brings sing to the lord a new song for he has done marvelous things sing to the lord a new song every morning new mercies he brings
Thank you, Jesus, that you are our saviour, you are a shelter, you are a tower and a refuge, our strength. And may we never cease to worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our affection, our deep. 
Morning, friends. Most of you might think uh, anywhere are you right now, but I'm standing here at such a cool place. It's actually a self-storage business, and it belongs to one of the leaders in our church, uh, Henny Wigget. And uh, about two weeks ago, um, myself, Vanessa, and uh, Henny and, and, and Nikki had a, a lovely cup of coffee, and they opened up a beautiful space here where we can come and record church. So up until now, we've been recording church at our home, um, but um, this is just on another level. And uh, I am so thankful that we have the privilege to, um, to enjoy this new space. Um, so as you can see, um, we're just taking a bit of a tour here. Yeah, I just wanna quickly show you and introduce you to the new space. Um, so for the next few months, um, till further notice, we will be recording all our services here. And, um, Yo, here we are actually at the container. Um, let, me, let me show you around. Isn't this just so cool? I really think it is so amazing. Such a warm and beautiful space. Um, yeah, so when you see worship or sermons happening, you'll be uh, seeing this space. And uh, oh, my heart is just so full today. Um, let's just walk around a little bit. Now you, can, now you can actually see what's happening at the back end here. And David, that's standing behind the camera right now and smiling at me. This is all his gear. And uh, now, now you actually know what, what's happening behind the scenes. Um, but, but this will be our space. Um, and as I said, my heart is really, my heart is really full today. And um, just so deeply grateful for what the Lord has opened up here. Uh, I know a lot of churches really... Um, struggle with resource and at this stage can't have services, can't even record services and friends I, I, I want to thank each and every one of you um, for all, also just you know really just um, being so faithful and uh, but today I want to really I want to I want to use the opportunity to thank Henny and Nikki uh, for this space for opening opening it up to us so that we so the church can take place so that the gospel can be preached so that worship can take place even though it's not corporately by, but in our homes uh, we have the opportunity to do it and uh, i just want to say we love you Henny, nikki thank you so much for your hearts and thank you so much for your gener generosity god bless you um, i'm giving over to peter now good morning remembrance today is my time to just share a little bit about the um, Tithing, but before I want to get there, I just want to share a quick story. So a couple of years ago, I sat one morning and I had my quiet time and 
Holy Spirit uh, showed me that I need to sow into someone's life. And um, I thought to myself, it's, okay, it's great, I'll do it, I'll do it when I'm done. And um, I never get to do it, never got to do it, I was so busy. And, and the Friday morning I woke up, I thought to myself, I really do it. And before I opened up my eyes, I realized I'm late for work and just a huge rush and I didn't get to do it. And um, the Saturday morning, I thought to myself, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll do it on the Monday, it's the end of the month, I'll do all my payments and um, I'll, I'll do that as well. So on the Monday, I, I did the payment um, and I'm quite happy that I, I could have contributed. But a couple of months later on, um, we were on a hunting trip and in the car, um, on our way there, um, one of my friends spoke about the Michelle story on on what happened um, a couple of months earlier on when he was in Nelspreit and he was um, at a house with an elderly couple. He was there for a couple of days and they really looked well um, after him in, in the time that he was there. But he really felt that he was just going to leave a little bit of money for them. Um, they didn't have a lot of money, they were really going through a tough time and um, he literally left all the money that he had on him there. He had no other money in his bank account. And he just really prayed when he left there and asked God to provide some money so he can get them back home. He had almost no petrol in his car. Um, and on his way back, he had a, he had a bit of an argument with God on, um, you know, he, he really felt that he heard God's voice and he did so, but, but nothing really happened. Um, and I had to phone a friend and asked him to deposit money into his account. So I had to confess and say to him, listen, I'm sorry, you know, it was uh, the, the exact amount that you gave away, um, you know, is the, is the money that I, that I should have paid in your bank account on that Friday morning and you only got on a Monday. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's never about our timing. Mean, it's, it's always about God's time. Um, and the reason why I want to share this, people, is that we, we're getting close to the end of the month and a lot of you guys have already received your income. A lot of you guys still need to receive, you know, still get, still have to get your, your, your salary for the month. But um, we need to understand that we can't, can't die the way that we feel we want to die. The Bible, it's a, um, you know, it's a great roadmap for this for us. Um, if you believe that it's part of the Old Testament, not part of the New Testament, because, you know, it's part of the law and so on. Um, Abraham died 500 years before the law. Um, you can go and read that up in Genesis 14 verse uh, 20. Um, and we need to understand that tithing is not a financial discussion, it's a spiritual discussion. Um, you know, our, our salvation is, is not connected um, to the obedience of tithing. And that was what, that's what the cross was for. Um, our, our tithing and our obedience um, just brings abundance in our life. Um, and I don't say for once that your financial situation will change when you die. It's not something that I can guarantee you, but if you go and read Malachi 13, 3 verse 10, um, Jesus guarantees that for you. So he says, you know, test, test me on this. Um, but what I want to just, uh, just point out is that you need to understand that um, testing goes both ways. Um, God says, test us in this, but we need to understand God wants our hearts, not our money. Um, he wants us to, to tithe um, because we want to give to give, not give to get. Um, if you feel that tithing hasn't changed your life, I want to challenge you. Go and look at the heart and, and the way that you've, that you've tithed. Um, was your motive always to tithe just to get something back? Or was your motive to tithe because that's what God has placed on your heart and that's what you really want to do? Um, most of you guys probably know who is Rabbi Zachariah. He passed away a couple of months or a couple of weeks ago, and um, and he always says something you know, that's that's just brilliant. If if there's something in the Bible that you don't resonate with um, and you feel that it's not for you, um, it's probably only because one reason it goes against your go against your lifestyle. It goes against what you like in life. It goes about it goes goes against your your pleasures and your heart's desires. Um, our fleshly desires will always try and figure out ways on, on how to keep money back. Um, but I can tell you guys that you know, every time that, that I made decisions because I thought it was the best best way to, to use my money is probably that I've made the biggest mistakes in, in, in my life and in business. Um, so Robert Morris um, has got a series of best life. Um, I assume most of you guys have seen it before. but. 
the section or one of the teachings um, is the principle of first. And he really talks about, you know, when do you sow and how much do you sow? And, and it's a great series to go and watch. But something that is just the um, standard out for me in that series is where he talks about um, when, when, when God explains the, the first fruit to the people, um, he said to them that bring 90, bring 10% to the storehouse and, um, and how the 90% will be blessed. And people we need to understand the word bring has been used for a reason and not give because you can only give what's yours. The word bring has been used for a reason because you can only bring 10% of what actually belongs to God already. Um, and I'll rather bring 10% um, and rather live with 90% that's blessed than live with 100% that's cursed. So I would encourage you guys um, to really be obedient. Um, we've got a we've got a snap a snap scan code at the end of the service, and after this, um, use that to make your to make your deposit. Um, or use the use the uh, the bank account for the church. Um, but be obedient, and um, hope you guys got a blessed day. Morning everyone. I'm going to be preaching today on something that the Lord has personally been talking to me and Henny about for the last few years. And this book happens to showcase that thing. This book is found in the middle of the Bible, anchoring the common theme of love that runs from Genesis to Revelation. It is one of the three wisdom books in the Bible and is written in language particular to the author of the entire Bible. A poetic parable of love, hope and relationship between the beloved and her bridegroom, the most glorious song of all, Song of Songs. On a deeper spiritual level, the song may be viewed as illustrating the quality of love that exists between Christ and his bride, the church, which should be an exclusive, committed, and intensely personal love that allows for no other courtships. I want to start with just a general look at Song of Songs, and to, I take this from the Bible Project's overview of Song of Songs. So Song of Songs is a collection of poems read as a flowing whole. The first line, Solomon's Song of Songs, is a Hebrew idiom, like Holy of Holies or King of Kings, a Hebrew way of saying the greatest thing. This is the greatest song of all songs. The opening poem introduces us to the main theme of the book. We hear the voice of the woman who delights in her man. They aren't married yet, but it becomes clear that they are engaged and they cannot wait to be together. From the introduction, the poems flow back and forth from the woman to the man, shifting from scene to scene without any kind of clear linear storyline. But the poems move in cycles and key themes that are repeated and developed. One of the main themes is this intense desire this couple has for one another. And this is expressed through their constant seeking and finding. After the opening poem, they are separated but on the hunt for one another. The woman calls out or she will go looking for her lover and more than once they'll find each other. They'll embrace and right when things get steamy, the scene ends and a new one will begin. Another repeated theme is the joy of the couple's physical attraction to one another. So multiple times they'll pause and describe one another with elaborate metaphors. These images and metaphors in Hebrew imagery are not primarily visual. If you try and paint a picture with these metaphors, you'll end up with a picture that is very strange indeed. What you're supposed to do is reflect on the meaning of these images. The poem highlights the power and the intensity of love, how it's both beautiful and dangerous. Like fire, love can destroy people if it's abused, or be life-giving if it's protected. Ultimately, love expresses the insatiable human longing to know and be fully known and desired by one another. Love is one of the most unequaled and mysterious of human experiences. And in this book of wisdom, it says, love is a gift from God. One of the main questions regarding Song of Songs is what on earth is love poetry doing in the Bible? And there have been three main interpretations through the ages. Firstly, in Jewish tradition, it's been read as an allegory depicting God and Israel and their love is the covenant that God uh, gave them 
made with them at Israel at Mount Sinai. Secondly, this then flowed through to Christianity, but the characters were swapped and it's read as Christ's love for his people, the church. And lastly, over the past hundred years, biblical scholars have viewed it as it presents itself, Hebrew love poetry reflecting the divine gift of love, but that doesn't mean that it is only ancient love poetry. There's a key feature of these poems that sticks out when you read them as part of the Old Testament, and that is the overwhelming use of garden imagery. There are powerful echoes of the Garden of Eden and the idyllic scene of the married couple and the early chapters of Genesis. So the image of the man and the woman, naked, vulnerable, completely unified and safe with one another, resonates in the background of Song of Songs. It's as if in these poems we are witnessing the love of a couple whose relationship is untainted by sin and selfishness. So ultimately, the song holds out hope that even though our own relationships are so often distorted by selfishness, Love is a transcendent gift, and it's meant to point us to something greater, to the gift of God's love that is supposed to permeate and transform us, his beloved bride. Henny and I have been married for 21 years, and if you asked us together how long we've been married, we will always say 21 glorious years. But the truth of the matter is that in some ways, yes, they have been glorious, most ways. Both of us have made many mistakes, fought with one another over silly, inconsequential things. But over the last few years, the Lord has been dealing with us about getting over ourselves, about how we treat one another. And as Christians, sometimes we read the Bible and take it as a mere suggestion regarding how we are supposed to live our lives. But you know what? The Bible is the word of God. It is the absolute standard of truth as to how we should live. My heart breaks when I have a conversation with my sister, who is pre-Christian, and she tells me how people they're doing business with will sign a letter, God bless, and add a scripture, and then my sister is done over in a deal. These people are, to use an old adage, they are talking the talk but not walking the walk. So how can we trust Solomon when it comes to marriage and sex advice? I mean, what do you believe from a guy who had hundreds of wives and concubines? We can trust what Solomon says, because God put Song of Songs in the Bible. All scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness, and if ever there was an Old Testament book that gives us hope, it is this one. Just from the idea of love that is shown from Christ to us in the type of the Beloved. And it is here that I pause to invite us into communion with Christ our Bridegroom. I'm going to read from Song of Songs 2 from verse 10. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig trees puts forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. This scripture is such, such a beautiful invitation to leave behind the sins of the world and our worldly problems into communion and union with Christ. And if we take the bread, <clears throat> we are reminded that Christ's body was broken for us. And when we, when we use the bread, um, I'm thinking of the scripture where it says the fig trees puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes. And that means that it's an, an invitation for us. Christ's body that was broken for us um, suggests that he accepts us and invites us to come to him. doesn't matter what you are experiencing right now, what you're going through. Maybe you think you're not good enough to partake. Maybe you think your faith is still tender and hasn't grown enough. And this is the picture that he says the tender grapes the vines with the tender grapes. And those are the fruits that maybe not be as well developed yet. And he's saying, let me develop those fruits. So that's what he's saying. When, he, when we break the bread, his body was broken for us, inviting us for us to have those fruits mature. Amen. So Jesus, we just thank you for your body that was broken for us. And we eat this in remembrance of what you did for us.
the wine is a reminder of his blood that was shed for us. And the scripture says, For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. So spiritually, he's saying the winter is over. His blood has washed us and cleansed us. So as we drink this, we drink this in remembrance of Jesus dying on the cross and all our sins are washed away by his blood. So the topic of today's sermon is relationship is a love story. Easy enough, Nikki, what's the problem? The problem is that when you start diving into Song of Songs and see God's standard for love, and you start reflecting on your marriage and the marriages of people around you in the church, then you realize how far short we are falling and failing. Our marriages are supposed to be a blueprint of a higher spiritual truth, which is our eternal marriage to Christ when we are joined forever with Him. Our marriages are supposed to reflect this truth, now, here on earth, and dare I say, a parable of the gospel laid before us. The primary message of this book is that human love, marriage, and sex are a gift from God. If there is one area where we tend to get into trouble, it is the latter. On the one hand, you have the worst excesses of Western culture, where sex is cheapened and disengaged from love, or at the worst, simply used as an expendable commodity. And at the other extreme, in many Eastern cultures, it is seen as dirty, not talked about, and women are hidden away behind closed doors. Song of Songs celebrates the joy of love within the context of a one-on-one -on -one relationship in marriage. I can't go through the whole of Song of Songs. Time doesn't allow for it. So I'm going to focus on Song of Songs 8, verse 6 to 7, which is after Solomon and the Shulamite maiden have gotten married. And as I go through these two verses, I want you to keep in mind that everything I say is applicable to each one of us, whether we are married or not. If you've been married for any amount of time, I'm quite certain that you have this communication thing all figured out. And so since you've got it all figured out, there's no worries. But in case you haven't and you recognize that we all have work to do in marriage, and we all do, then it would be good to stay tuned. If you're watching this morning and there have been things that have happened in your past and your marriage and your marriage didn't work out the way that you hoped it would. If there's any shame or embarrassment, don't let that grab your attention today. There's grace and love in Christ Jesus and that we all, no matter where we are in the journey of marriage, we are all in desperate need of grace. And so don't let the past guilt rob you of a present joy. What if you're a single person and you're listening today? Well, Song of Songs is part of wisdom literature, so it would be wise to listen and study what it says. Proverbs, for instance, tells men to be patient regarding the kind of woman that they want to marry. And then in Song of Songs, he assures the daughters of Jerusalem over and over again not to awaken love until it's ready. Today's sermon is for the married, it is for the divorced, it is for the single, because as we come to the subject of marriage, it's something that we must discuss in a place where the culture has shifted, shifted away from everything that has been established for millennia. So let's get into today's scripture. Song of Songs 8, verse 6 to 7. Place me as a seal upon your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. So, firstly, love is possessive. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. In ancient Israel and Judah, as elsewhere in the Near East, a seal was used to secure legal documents such as contracts. This tiny object was roughly the size of a fingertip and usually made of stone. Hundreds of examples have been found in the land of Israel. By comparing yourself to a seal, it shows that she wishes to both be both precious property and a personal belonging. This established her authority, identity, and belonging. In other words, she is saying, I'm giving myself to you as a sign of my love for you. I will be your possession. When we say our wedding vows and we say, I take you, which means as a husband or wife, we hopefully are willingly giving ourselves away to one another, to be possessed by the other person, totally and exclusively. Now, I seriously suck at maths, but this is my marriage son. 
If each one of us is only willing to give half of our salt, half of our time, loyalty, possession, passion, whatever it is, we're seriously going to see diminished results. Half times a half is a quarter. But if you're willing to give 100% of yourself, you're going to see a far more different outcome. In the last year, God has spoken to me about the things I say to Henny. My natural go-to is to be critical and harsh. I'm not a soft kind of person who says nice things to people or to Henny. Um, and the Lord really spoke to me about that over the last year. And I was thinking about our lives together and, and you know, we've been married for 21 years. And the Lord said to me, Nikki, do you want to stand one day when Henny dies and stand in front of a bunch of people and tell them what you think about your husband? And it just, it really grabbed my heart. And I knew that the Lord wants me to say the things that I love about him, that he wants me to say that to Henny, not to people one day when he dies. And that's what we've decided to do. So now when um, the person, when Henny does something that I love or, you know, he, he boosts me or whatever, I tell him, I tell him how much I appreciate it. And um, I just, yeah, really tell him all the things that, that's on my heart about him. So that's, yeah, I don't have to say it to a bunch of people one day. Um, I can say it straight to him. And it's really made such a difference in our marriage. So when it comes to marriage, and we go back to Genesis 2, verse 23 to 20, 24, we know that God instituted marriage. And for Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam looks at his wife and he says, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I will forsake everyone. I will leave my father and mother. This is an astounding statement from Adam because he didn't have a mother or father. He says he will abandon and forsake everyone just to hold on to Eve. And the two will become one. And the reason they will become one is that it is a sacred union instituted by God. Paul quotes the scripture in Galatians, but then he helps us understand that, the, that this, this mystery is profound and it points us to Christ. We read about another seal promised to us by God in Ephesians 1 verse 13. This seal is exactly the same as the seal in Song of Songs verse 8. And you were, also, you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We are not sealed off or put in a bubble wrap when we give our lives to the Lord, but He does promise that He seals us, He stamps us with the Holy Spirit, forever marked by the Lord. And this establishes our authority, identity, and belonging. So secondly, true love is permanence. For love is as strong as death, it's jealousy, unyielding as the power of the grave. So what she is saying here about her love being as strong as death is that her true love and passion for her lover will last until the grave. Unfortunately, we live in a time in which marriage is often considered a disposable commodity. The Barna Group did a study and found that Christians are just as likely, if not more likely, to get divorced as atheists and agnostics. I'm obviously not a proponent of staying in an abusive marriage, being a first-hand witness of the destructiveness that comes with abuse. My plea, though, is when your marriage hits a rocky patch, and you will hit a rocky patch. Several, in fact. Don't throw in the towel. Instead, seek counsel and apply the advice you get to your marriage. True love is permanent. True love is not here today and gone tomorrow. True love is as strong as death. Jealousy has such a negative connotation, but in this verse, jealousy isn't the green-eyed monster kind, but rather one that comes from a place of sincere care and commitment. Wives, Trust your husband's instincts. He knows how men think, what they want, and how they pursue it. It would be crazy not to listen to his warnings. Men, trust your wife's instincts. In case you didn't know, we have a built-in radar that picks up on things you wouldn't even begin to see. So don't criticize or blame her warnings on insecurity. Scripture says in Exodus 34 that our God is a jealous God. Does that mean that God is insecure or abusive? God is perfect, loving, patient, and righteous, and He demands exclusive faithfulness. And right here at the heart of the law establishes how permanent this relationship is. So true love is possessive and permanent. Thirdly, true love is powerful. It burns like a blazing fire, a mighty flame. Love is described as burning hot, a powerful fire. 
it is anything but lukewarm. You and I may think we know what that means. We know something of what love is, and we know about fire, about flames that rage and leap, and burn powerful flames. To compare love to this fire, certain experiences of love at least make, uh, may make sense to us. The words mighty flame can be translated as the flame of Yahweh or a God flame. So love is not simply a flame that rages in a way no other flame can outshine. Love is also the God flame. Just what does this mean? It may mean that human love somehow participates in divine love, even the passion uniting wife and husband. Love is an exclusive, soul-consuming experience for which we humans yearn. So, such passion for another is a gift. It cannot be purchased and it cannot be sold. Love can only be given freely. This is a point that is easily forgotten in our day and age because the mindset of this fallen world has confused sex and love and it imagines that sex is a conquest of personal fulfillment. We celebrate the momentary sacrificing permanence on the altar of temporary. For most of mankind, including far too many professing Christians, we think of love only in terms of personal gratification. And if you doubt that assessment, think of how sex is communicated in our culture. Have you heard of the saying, sex sells? It's used to sell programs, products, movies, food, you name it. And the problem for our culture and us as individuals is not sex. Even though we have a distorted view of love, the underlying cause of all the problems in this world is sin. And I would be failing here if I didn't mention the devastating effects of pornography in homes across the world. Pornography is a $15 billion a year industry that promises thrills and sexual satisfaction, but it cannot give anyone deep and lasting performance. King Solomon once said, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Proverbs 6 verse 23. Along those lines, can you repeatedly bring sexually arousing images into your head without consequences? When God created us, he gave us a desire for love and intimacy that we could satisfy only in a relationship with him and to some degree through a special relationship with one man or one woman. It breaks God's heart to see men bypass these relationships in pursuit of mere images, lifeless reproductions that can arouse but never give or receive love. What's more, God has a plan for you that's good. He's not anti-sex, it was his idea in the first place. He created sex to be the deepest physical expression of intimacy between a man and woman, and he wants us to experience pure sexual performance in the way that he planned. Unfortunately, pornography damages our sexuality, not to mention the mental and emotional parts of us. Pornography isn't wrong because God wants to kill our fun. It's wrong because our lovingly he loving Heavenly Father wants to protect us from porn's damaging effects and keep us pure. When we guard our hearts and minds, we can enter joyfully into marriage, the exclusive place God created for sexual expression and true intimacy. In order to experience sex as God designed it, we need to be walking the road of purity. No matter what you've been involved in up to at this point, God is ready and waiting to help you get back on the road. To get there, you've got to make a serious commitment to restoration and new life. What the world desperately needs is new life. One created by God himself, such life is offered to each person through faith in the Son of God, a permanent, powerful love in place of temporary pleasure. And fourth and fifthly, true love is persevering and precious. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Perseverance is the ability to endure, to persist, to hang on, and to carry on through many different types of circumstances. Perseverance is determination to work hard and to continue, even when life throws curveballs or adds pressures that cause tension and conflict. It is important to have perseverance in marriage, especially when a husband and wife have committed to each other till death us do part. No jokes, love is hard sometimes. There are times when we don't like our spouse, let alone love them. And quite honestly, there are times when Henny makes me want to tear my hair out. But you know, I've pushed on and persevered with him for 21 years. Seriously, we need to know that God's love perseveres through us, helping us so that we can love. Money can buy us anything our hearts desire, but the one thing money can't buy is love. But love does have a cost. Love calls us to sacrifice of ourselves for the ones we love, even when we feel they don't deserve it. 
There is the story of a group of American prisoners of war during the Second World War who were made to do hard labor in a prison camp. Each one had a shovel and would dig all day, then come in and give an account of his tool in the evening. One evening, 20 prisoners were lined up by the guard and their shovels were counted. The guard counted only 19 shovels and turned in rage on the 20 prisoners, demanding to know which one of them did not bring their shovel back. No one responded. The guard took out his gun and said that he would shoot five men if the guilty prisoner did not step forward. After a moment of tense silence, a 19-year-old soldier, the age of my Philip, stepped forward with his head bowed down. The guard grabbed him, took him to the side and shot him in the head and turned to warn the others and said they better be more careful. When he left, the, man, the men counted the shovels again and there were 20. The guard had miscounted. And the boy had given his life for his friends. Can you imagine the emotions that must have filled their hearts as they knelt down over his body? In the five or ten seconds of silence, the boy had weighed his whole future in the balance. A future wife, an education, a new track, children, a career, fishing with his dad. And he chose death so that others might live. Jesus has loved you this way, but only oh so much more. The greatest picture of true love is that Jesus died for his bride, the church, in every possible and perfect way, Jesus' love for his own is possessive, permanent, powerful, persevering, and precious. Jesus sets believers as a seal upon his own heart, indicating that we are his possession. Jesus showed that his love is indeed strong as death, and that he died for his own, that showed the permanence of his love. Jesus' love for believers is indeed powerful. It is the very flame of the Lord. Jesus' love is persevering. Nothing in all creation can separate believers from the love of God that is in Christ. And Jesus' love for his own is precious. We cannot buy his love. Instead, Jesus' love is given to his own, a gift of free grace. So I thank you and I, I really hope that this message touched you and I'm just going to pray now. Father, I lift up every marriage to you today. Lord, I thank you that um, you died for us. I thank you that your love for us is powerful and possessive and that, you, that you're rooting for us, that you want us to be successful in our marriages. Lord, I just, you know, I just speak to those, those people that are watching today whose marriages are in trouble and Lord, I just pray for each one of them that you show them the way, that you show them um, where they can go to for help. And Father, that I just pray that you break that um, power of pornography over the men that are watching. Jesus, I know that you came and that you can set us free. You can set us free. So I just speak to that that addiction now in the mighty name of Jesus and I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus that it breaks I thank you Lord for your love I thank you Lord for your love I thank you for the freedom that you bring in Jesus name Amen thank you so much for watching everybody um, have a blessed week and we'll see you again next Sunday